So here we've got this sample circuit that has uh, multiple loops and also these two switches. And a switch, uh, what, is this, what exactly does a switch do? Like if I've just got a switch, what is that for? Is it to stop the current flow? Yeah, one thing it does, if, if it's open, like this would be the open position of the switch. You've got a wire coming in and a wire going out, but they're not connected. There's this gap between them. So current can't flow through that gap. But as soon as I close the switch by pushing it down like this, this metal bar now connects those wires. So in the closed position, the switch allows current to flow through. And the, the main use of a switch is it allows you to have the user toggle between two or more different situations, two or more different states of the circuit. Like in this case, for instance, we've got two switches. Right now, both switches are open. So is there anywhere for current to flow? No. Correct. Well, so that means, sorry, what was that? Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, in this case, there's no, there is a complete loop in the sense of, uh, if you consider this loop here, that is a complete loop, but what's missing from that loop? What does that loop not have? A battery? Yeah, it's got resistors, but it's got no battery. So there's no, there's no voltage source. There's no boost in voltage that would cause current to flow. So with the, the circuit laid out as it is right now, no current is gonna flow because there's no complete loop that has a voltage source. But if we start closing one of the switches, like let's say we take switch one and close it in the sense of swiveling this so that it connects. Now do we have a complete loop with the battery? Yeah. Yeah. This loop here is a complete loop with a battery so current can flow. Or alternatively, if we take switch two, Let's say we open switch one, but close switch two. Now we also have a loop where current can flow. In fact, now I guess you could say we've got two loops. We've got the loop through the battery and this top resistor and the three ohm resistor. And we've also got a loop through the battery and this lower path and the three ohm resistor. So in that sense, you could say there's two loops that you could apply the loop rule to. Or probably an easier way, if you've got these two resistors, this one and this one, how would you say those two resistors are connected? They're parallel. Right, those two resistors are definitely in parallel. And that means we can combine them. We can treat these two resistors as if it's just one big resistor. And how would we find the equivalent resistance of that one big resistor? It would be the inverse of one over R plus one over R. Yeah. One over the equivalent resistance equals one over R1 plus one over R2, and possibly plus more if you've got multiple resistors in parallel. In this case, though, there's just these two resistors in parallel with each other. So we would just add their inverses together, one over R1 plus one over R2. And usually you'd need to find a some common denominator there, but in this case, R1 and R2 are the same. They're both just some unknown resistance, but the same unknown resistance R. So one over R plus one over R would be two over R. So is two over R the equivalent resistance? It would be R over two. Yeah, because two over R, when we add those together, that gives us the inverse of the equivalent resistance. So we need to invert both sides. Raise both sides to the negative one power. In other words, R equivalent equals, as you said, R over two. So that means these two resistors together act like a single resistor whose resistance is R over two. And is that stronger or weaker than each resistor individually? Stronger? R over two? If you take half of the number, oh, then they no. get bigger or smaller. Yeah. So that means that the two resistors combined in parallel actually form a weaker resistor than either resistor on its own. 
And that's generally going to be true for parallel. If you've got a, a path that splits into several paths and then joins back together, so that you've got paths in parallel, the whole thing will have a total resistance that's less than the weakest resistor in that, in that network. Because if you've got branching paths, having multiple paths makes it easier for current to flow. Like for instance, if you've got a, a single road linking two cities, it's going to be probably a lot of traffic. But if you have that branch out into multiple paths, having more paths available makes it easier to get from one place to the other. Might be more complicated to get directions, but it at least eases the flow of traffic by providing multiple pathways. And you get a similar effect for circuits and also for fluid flow as well. If you've got multiple pipes branching out, multiple pathways, that's going to be less resistance than any one of those pipes individually. So what we can do here is ignore this parallel uh, network and treat it instead as one single resistor with resistance R over two. So we'll just label that R over two. And also for that matter, we can combine this R over two resistor with the three ohm resistor, because how are those connected? They're in series. Right, those are in series. So what can we do with their resistances? You just add them together. Yeah, we can just add these together, R over two plus three ohms. So we'll treat this as just one big resistor whose equivalent resistance is R over two plus three. So let me blank that out. We'll just merge that with the resistor we've already got and say that this, this path has a total resistance of R over two plus three ohms. So the entire lower path has a resistance of R over two plus three. Meanwhile, if we try the same approach for the upper path, uh, what's the total resistance of this upper path? Just 20 plus R. Yeah, we can merge those together. So let's say we ignore this R resistor and the 20 ohm resistor and just treat them as merged together as R plus 20. In that case, we can now treat each one of those branches as just having a single resistor of a resistance that we don't really know the resistance because R is still unknown, but we can at least write the total resistance of each path in terms of this one unknown variable. Any questions on that simplified circuit so far? So let's examine the current here. It gives us some information in this problem about the current. Uh, specifically, it tells us if we close the first switch, S1, measure the current coming out of the battery. So let's try that. If we have, let's say we start with both switches open, but then let's say we close switch one. And we'll have current flowing out of the battery. Can you calculate how much current that would get? if we were going through this loop. Would it be possible to calculate that current? Or to write out an equation that would allow us to calculate the current? We can write out an equation. Yeah, and what equation is gonna be relevant there? Um, I it starts with like a K and it's the loop. Yeah, Kirchhoff's uh, loop rule or voltage rule. Because we are talking about a loop. So the, the loop rule or Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law is just the idea that in, in any complete loop, if you just put your finger at some, well, not your finger, because you don't want to get shocked. If you just consider some location on the wire and draw a complete loop coming back to your starting point, what has to be true about that loop since you came back to the same starting point? Um, delta V has to be zero. Yeah. The total delta V, the sum of all the delta Vs you encounter must be zero. Mm -hmm. 
And there are exceptions to that. If there's some sort of changing magnetic effect, magnet, changing magnetism can cause issues with this, that these voltages don't have to add up to zero. But in this class, we're not gonna be dealing with magnetic fields. So you can assume that the sum of the delta voltages is zero. We are gonna see this a little bit at the end of 7C. We're gonna be dealing with uh, magnetic effects that can cause changes to this. But for now, without any weird magnetic stuff, the delta Vs in a loop have to add up to zero. In this loop, what things are you passing through that, it, that, are, that have delta V associated with them? Like, let's say you start here and you go around the loop. What things do you encounter? The battery and then the resistance. Yeah, so we've got a delta V associated with the battery. We've got a delta V associated with the resistor. And those have to add up to zero. So in order to write that, uh, in order to write that in terms of formulas, what's usually the delta V associated with any battery? In general, for a battery, what would you expect the delta V to have to be? The E term. Yeah, that E or epsilon, which is just some positive constant. So that plus epsilon, also known as the electromotive force of the battery, that's just a representation of how strong the battery is. And it's usually labeled on the battery, like a nine volt battery, epsilon is nine volts. And that just describes the difference in voltage that that battery creates. That battery creates a distinction between a high voltage side on the positive terminal and a low voltage side on the negative terminal. And epsilon represents the difference between those zones. So we might say one side of the battery is at zero volts and the other side is at positive epsilon volts. We just don't know what epsilon is yet. And as for delta V resistor, what's the usual formula for delta V of a resistor? I times R. Yeah. I times R, and also since it's a voltage drop, we'll call that negative I times R. And we know the resistance here is actually R plus 20. So let's fill that in. Because it's the resistance of that entire path. So R plus 20 ohms. And then I, and let's call that I1 since this is the current in the first situation. And then can you solve that for I1? How would you isolate I1 there? Um, you get epsilon over 20 plus R. Yeah. I1 equals epsilon over R plus 20 plus R. So even though we don't know what epsilon and R equal, we at least know a uh, formula for I1 in terms of the unknown epsilon and the unknown R. Any questions on that so far? And let's try applying the same principle of Kirchhoff's voltage law or the loop rule to the lower loop. Because the problem also says if you open S1 again, If we open S1, cutting off current in that loop, and close switch two instead, now we're going to have current flowing through the lower loop. So in this loop, it looks like we're going through the same sort of situation. You're passing through a battery and an, um, if, effectively one resistor. So we could write out the same thing. Delta V battery plus Delta V resistor equals zero. And we can still write out the same epsilon plus negative IR. Although in this case, it'll be negative I2 because it's the current in the lower loop times, and then what's the equivalent resistance there? Three plus R over two. Yeah. So those have to add up to zero. And then we can solve for current the same way. Solve for I2, and what would you end up with? 
we would get e over r2 plus 3 equals 4i1. Yeah. And yeah, the fact that it tells us that in the second case, the current is four times greater than in the first case, we can say that the current two equals four times as much as current one. So let's write that out. We are given the information that current two is four times as much as current one. So if we fill in these values, we can say current two, equals four times current one. Any questions on that so far? And conveniently, what's the same in both of these equations? What do these both have that we can immediately get rid of? The epsilon. Yeah, they both have that same epsilon, the same electromotive force of the battery. So we could divide both sides by epsilon and cancel that out. Divide by epsilon, divide by epsilon. And now this equation really only has one unknown. It shows up twice on both sides of the equation, but it's only one unknown resistance. Any thoughts on how we could start solving for that unknown R? You could cross multiply. In what sort of sense? What would we get if we cross multiply here? Uh, you would get I1 times R plus 20 equals 4 I1 times R over 2 plus 3. Oh, that's not an I1, though. That's just 1 and 1. Because we've, uh, we've made oh. substitutions for I1 and I2. So yeah, we just have one over r over two plus three and four over r plus 20. So four, and you can also just think of this as inverting both sides. If you raise both sides to the negative one power, you get r over two plus three ohms over one equals r plus 20 ohms over four. And at that point, we could just multiply both sides by four. r over two times four would be two r, 3 ohms times 4 would be 12 ohms. And then on the right side, the 4s cancel out. And then what could we do? What else would we still need to do to isolate R here? You subtract 12 from 20 ohms. Sorry, what was that? Like you subtract the ohms, like 20 minus 12 to isolate the... Yeah, if you subtract 12 ohms from both sides, that'll at least cancel out the 12 ohms. The problem is we still have R on both sides though. How can we address that? Is there any way you could just get rid of this R here? Mm -hmm. Would you just like subtract R from both sides? Yes, yeah. if we just subtract R from both sides. Then the R's cancel out on the right side and we just get 20 ohms minus 12 ohms, which is eight ohms. And on the left side, 2R minus R is R, 12 minus 12 is zero. So R has to be eight ohms. So that's, uh, that's the result for R. R has to be eight ohms here. Any questions on that so far? And now that we know that, for the second problem, I think we can use that fact. We know R is eight. So for instance, if we, the entire lower path, if we fill in eight, we get eight over two plus three. So what's that gonna be? If you replace R with eight here. 
Seven. Yes. So the entire lower path is seven ohms as the, the total equivalent resistance. And the entire upper path, you fill in eight for R and you get what? 28. Yeah. So 28 ohms is the equivalent resistance for the entire upper path. Wait, so I, know, I was kind of lost. How did you get the 12 ohms? Oh, that was from uh, at this step, we can multiply both sides by four. Oh, so R over, okay. and that distributes R over two times four is two R because oh. they over two. Okay. And then yeah, three ohms times four is gonna be 12 ohms. And then on the right side, the four just cancels out. So we're left with R plus 20. Any other questions on the algebra there so far? So at this point, we now know all of the resistances, uh, 28 ohms for the entire upper path, seven ohms for the entire lower path. But in part two, it says we close both switches. And we find that the voltage of the battery is 14 volts. So in this case, the voltage is now given. And we want to know what's the current through the battery. And one way to do this, there's probably several different ways to do this. One of them is if we just start labeling voltage, labeling currents. Let's say we call this current, uh, let's say we call that I sub zero, the current through the battery I sub zero. And then we've also got currents. What happens to current when it hits a junction like this? The current will split. Yeah, current's gonna split. So we've got some current going through the upper path. Let's call that, uh, I guess we were already calling the upper path, path number one. So that's I1. And likewise, we also have current going through the lower path. Let's call that I2. And then when they hit this junction, they join back together again to form I sub zero. And according to the other Kirchhoff law, Kirchhoff's current law or the junction rule, what does that claim about the current? What should we expect? Yeah. Oh, wait, what are you going to say? Uh, what would we expect about the current? If we're talking about, let's say, some single point, like let's say, uh, let's say at this location, what do we know about all the currents associated with that junction? The current going into the junction has to be the same as the current coming out. Yeah, we can say the total of all the current going into the junction has to match the total of all the current going out of the junction. And that turns out to be true, not just for junctions, but for any point on the circuit. If you consider, for example, this location right here, the current flowing in is just I2, the current flowing out is also just I2. So that's actually how we know that, or one way of justifying the fact that the current is the same everywhere in that path. Current in to that corner must equal current out of that corner. But it's most useful at junctions, because if we apply the current rule at this, the current law at this junction, what can we say about I0, I2, and I1? Uh, the current going to equal each other? Specifically, what equals what? How about we write that as an equation? I1 plus I2 equals I0. Yeah. Because I0 is the current flowing into that point, and I1 and I2 are both flowing out of that point. So I0 is the total current flowing in, and I1 plus I2 is the total current flowing out. Which means if we can find I1 and I2 individually, we can add them together to find I0. Yeah. 
So let's take a look at I1, for instance. If you draw out the top loop, it looks like this is the same loop as before. We're going through the battery, we're going through this top resistor. So we can still use the exact same equation we had earlier that you're going through a battery, you're going through a resistor. So plus epsilon plus negative I1 R1 equals zero. So I1 should still be epsilon over R plus 20 ohms. But what do we know about those values now? Can we fill in values for epsilon and R? Yeah. Yeah, because epsilon was given to be 14 volts. So we can fill that in. R we calculated was eight. So we get 14 over 28. And that reduces to, what is that going to be? Two. Um, uh, 28 over 14 would be two, but 14 over 28 would be? Oh, one half. Yeah. So that means this current is half of an amp, since volts over ohms is amps. So we know that's the current through this top portion. And then through the bottom portion, we can use the same equation we used earlier, because this is still, if you draw out uh, this loop, we're still going through the battery and this one equivalent resistor. So we still have plus epsilon from the battery and minus IR from that resistor. Exact same equation as before. Fill in uh, 14 for epsilon, and we found this was 7 because 8 over 2 plus 3. So 14 over 7. So what's that current going to be? 2. Yeah, 2 amps. And note that that fits with the original idea that the current in the second loop is four times as much as the current in the first loop, since 2 amps is four times as much as 1 half. And then what do we do with those two currents? We equal them to each other? Uh, well, they're not equal to each other. Or, I mean, we, do uh, know, we add them together. Yeah, because we know that I naught is I1 plus I2 from the junction rule. So add those up, half an amp plus two amps would be 2.5 amps. So that'll be I naught. The current through the battery here will be 2.5 amps. Any questions on that so far? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Could you also find the equivalent resistance of the top and bottom? Yeah, yeah, that would absolutely be another way to do it. If we ignore right. the current through each one individually, if we instead just combine these, because at this stage, how would you say the 28 ohm resistor and the seven ohm resistor are combined with each other? They're parallel. Yeah, these are in parallel. Even if it's not immediately obvious from looking at it just because of the weird shape of the wires, if you take a look at these paths, the top loop is a path that starts at this high voltage zone and ends at this low voltage zone. The bottom loop, is also a path that starts at this high voltage zone and ends at this low voltage zone. Both of those paths start at the same location and take different paths to end at the same location as each other. That's the definition of in parallel. So both paths start at the same location and end at the same location. So those are definitely in parallel. We can combine those by adding their inverses, one over 28 plus one over seven. So one over 28 plus one over seven invert that result, and that'll tell you the total resistance of the entire circuit. And then the current should just be epsilon divided by that equivalent resistance. That should also give you 2.5 amps. Any questions on that? Uh, no, but I had a clarifying question. So mm -hmm. when they mention junction, does that mean like a specific point? Um, the junction rule could be applied to any point on the wire, but it's usually applied to junction in the sense of several wires coming together. Mm. Like for instance, I would say this is a junction because you've got three wires coming together and this is also uh, a junction. Oh, so it's one thing. Yeah, when you've got like a, a, a T intersection or more complicated than that, if you've got three or more wires coming together. Mm. 
And a corner like this, or even just a single point on the wire, you can still apply the junction rule. Current into that point has to equal current out of that point. In fact, you could even apply it to regions. You could say like, uh, if you have like this entire region of wire, the total current flowing into that region has to equal the total current flowing out of that region. You can draw whatever shape you want and that will be true. But it's usually most useful when applied to a junction where three or more wires meet. So it's called the junction rule because that's where it's most useful. But it applies to any region of wire or any single point on a wire. Any other questions on that in general? Or any other questions on circuits you'd like to address? When you like encounter a circuit problem, mm -hmm. like do you recommend starting by simplifying the resistances? That's often a good idea, yeah. It, it, it sometimes depends on what exactly you're trying to find. Uh, but most of the time, if, like, especially if you know all the resistances or at least have labels for the unknown resistances, like the R here, then it's often a good idea to start by simplifying all the resistors and then, uh, and then work from there with the simplified circuit. Uh, for example, let me pull up a different example here that I think might be useful. Uh, can you see this one? Yeah. So if we're dealing with a circuit like this, like in this case, for instance, we know the voltage of the battery, we know the resistance of every resistor, and we know how they're arranged. And let's say the, the goal here would be to find the current everywhere. And note that this has multiple currents. Like you have, let's say, the current going through the battery. Presumably we would call that I sub zero as usual. But note that that's the same as the current going through resistors one and five. That's just one path. So there's a single current associated with that. So in fact, even before uh, splitting up the, or before combining the resistors, I think probably the best way to start would be to examine the circuit, figure out how many different currents you can expect and label all of them. The current through the battery, I would usually call I zero and also identify anything in series with the battery will have the same resistance. But then what happens when we hit this junction here? We'll get um, two different currents. Yeah. So I would label those. Uh, and currents, sometimes you can just label them sequentially, I1, I2, I3, and so on. Or sometimes it's a good idea to label them based on what resistors they're going through. Like for instance, I might label this one probably I2 because it's going through resistor two. And then the other one, Uh, since this is going through resistors three and four and then merging back with I2 again, I'd probably call that I3. And there's some flexibility with naming here. Just make it clear what current you're talking about on the diagram. Make sure everything's clearly labeled. So figure out uh, how many currents there are, label them on the diagram with where they are. And at that point, I think it would be a good idea, once you know what you're looking for, all, you've, you've labeled all the unknowns, then it's a good idea to uh, start simplifying this, the resistors. For instance, what are some pairs or, or trios or whatever of resistors we could easily combine here? We could combine three and four. Yeah, three and four are very definitely in series because it's just one single path through both of them. So we could say R34, how would we combine those? We just add them together. Yeah, five plus seven is 12. So this entire path acts like a 12 ohm resistor. And that path, if we just think of that as one 12 ohm resistor, how is that, or how, what, what, what else can that be combined with? You could combine it in parallel with R2. Yeah, R2 is in parallel with R34, that entire branch. So we combine those with reciprocals, one over eight plus one over 12. 
And what would be a good common multiple there, common denominator? A multiple of eight and 12. 24. Yeah, 24 works well. Eight is, eight, eight times three would be 24. So one eighth is three over 24. And 24 is twice 12, so 224. Add those up, we get 5 24 And then what else would we need to do to find the equivalent resistance? Um, you need to, oh, take the inverse. Yeah, invert that 24 fifths, um, which is also what, 4 and 4 fifths, so 4.8. So resistors two, three, and four together act like a single 4.8 ohm resistor. And at that point, once we've merged these together into just one big resistor, now we essentially have just one loop. So how can we combine all of those resistors? You just add them together because they're in a yeah. series. Exactly. Once we've simplified it to effectively one loop, everything in that one loop is in parallel. So we can just add three ohms plus 4.8 ohms plus two ohms and get 9.8. So the total equivalent resistance for the whole thing is 9.8 ohms. That is, this whole thing acts like just a 98-volt battery attached to a 9.8 ohm resistor. So what does that tell you about the current? Um, the current is 10 ohms. Because if you just got a single loop with one battery and equivalently one resistor, the current is just going to be epsilon over R. That's 98 over 9.8, so that's 10. And that specifically tells us, going back to the original circuit, which one of those currents have we just found? We found the current of R1 on the battery and then R5. Yeah, exactly. Because the battery is the one thing we didn't simplify here. Everything else we've condensed together. But since the battery wasn't simplified, the current we found was the current through the battery. And as you said, also through R1 and R2, R5, because those are the same current. So we now know the current through those three. And we know that I2 and I3 have to add up to 10 ohms, but we don't know exactly how it splits up. But a very useful next step to take is to start mapping out voltages uh, in terms of figuring out which locations are at what voltage. And what I usually do here is just start labeling based on Let's say we're looking at the, I usually start with the point right before the battery. So the point, the, the negative terminal of the battery, because that region, not just a single point, but this entire zone, that negative terminal of the battery causes this zone to be the lowest voltage in the whole system. So what would be a good label to put on that? If we want to just choose a number to label that voltage, what would be a good number to call that? You can make it zero. Yeah, let's call that zero volts. So this region, the, this corner of wire attached to the negative terminal of the battery, we'll call that the zero volt region. We go through the battery, and what does the battery do to voltage? It'll draw, oh wait, no, it keep, it's the same right after the battery. Uh, battery, well, the, the current's the same, but the, the voltage is gonna change. Is the voltage. Yeah, the whole point of a battery is to provide a boost to voltage. So the, the battery creates a distinction between a high voltage side attached to its positive terminal, shown by the long bar, and a low voltage side, the negative terminal, shown by the short bar. So we should expect this to be higher voltage, and specifically how much higher? 98. Yeah, the epsilon tells you how much higher the positive terminal is than the negative terminal in terms of voltage. So we've got a zero volt region, a 98 volt region. Then when we go through a resistor, what would you expect to happen to the voltage? It'll drop. Yeah, we're going to have a lower voltage here, which means that the zone after resistor one, and not just this point, but any locations connected to it by just wire, this entire zone is going to be at some lower voltage, 98 minus some voltage drop. And how can we figure out how much the voltage decreases there? How would you find the delta voltage for this resistor? Is it just um, minus IR? Yeah, delta V for resistor is negative IR. Uh, and we know the resistance. And most importantly, we also know the current. 
Since we know resistance and current, we can multiply those together and get what? Uh, 30. Yeah. So that means the delta voltage for this resistor is negative 30 volts. That is, as you pass from one side of this resistor to the other, there's a difference of negative 30 volts. We started with 98 volts, we lose 30 volts, we're now at 68 volts. So this region is a 68 volt region. And if you take a look at the next resistor, like let's say R3, we don't really know the voltage on the other side of that. So we can't really proceed there yet. But let's work backwards. If we go back to the zero volt region, we know we have a two ohm resistor and we know the current flowing through it. So what's the delta V for that resistor number five? Um, minus 20. Yeah which means that this resistor is associated with a difference of 20 volts from one side to the other. We start at some presumably higher voltage. We lose 20 volts, we end at zero. So what did the voltage before that resistor have to be? This is on right here. What voltage would that have had to have been? 20, wait, yeah, yeah. 20. Yeah, if you start with 20 volts and you lose 20 volts, you end up at zero. So this zone had to have been a 20 volt region. And not just that single point, but also any points connected to it by just wire are also at 20 volts. So this whole region is 20 volts, this whole region all the way up to resistor four, that entire zone is all at 20 volts. And that's great because we now have a bit, we now have a basis for comparison. Specifically, if you look at resistor two here, resistor two, we now know the voltage before and the voltage after. So what's the delta voltage for resistor two? So it'd be 68 minus 20. Yeah. So that looks like what, 48 volts? And since it's a drop, we'll call that negative 48 volts. So focusing on resistor two for now, we know delta V is negative 48 volts because that's the difference from start to finish. And also we can set that equal to what formula? Um, I, R, and then okay. solve for I. Exactly, and I would include the negative there because we are including a negative in the delta V. Uh, that is in the direction currents flowing, we should expect a voltage drop. And we know R, eight ohms. So what does the current have to be then? Six. Yes. Yeah. From 48 divided by eight. So that's current two. We now have a value for that. And then would current three just be four? Yeah, exactly. Using the junction rule, because we know we've got 10 ohms, or sorry, not ohms, that should be amps all along. And the amps flowing in, and six ohms plus something flowing out, that other something would have to be four amps. So we now know current three as well. Which you could also get based on the fact that this path has 12 ohms res of resistance total. 12 ohms of resistance divided by 40, or 48 volts of difference divided by 12 ohms would also give you four amps. So treating R3 and R4 as just one big resistor of 12 ohms, you're losing 40 volts, 48 volts divided by 12 ohms is also four amps. And one last thing we could do here as well, we could figure out the one missing piece of information. Uh, this voltage here, the voltage in this corner. Because we know, for example, we've got a seven ohm resistor, four amps of current. So what's the voltage drop there? Uh, minus 28. Yeah, 68 volts minus 28 gives us 40 volts left over. So that would means, R, sorry, or, what was that? Um, would R4 also have a current of four amps? Yes, because uh, three and four, I, I'm just labeling this I3, but it's the current through this entire branch, this entire path. So that'll be 68 volts minus 28 would be 40 volts. So this corner is a 40 volt region. And then as one final check, you could also say four amps times five ohms is 20 volts. So you lose 20 volts. 40 minus 20 gives you 20 volts. 
so it all fits together. And how do we get the 10 amps for current? Uh, that was comparing the battery to the total resistance. As we found earlier that the total resistance of the entire circuit was 9.8 ohms by combining all the resistors to get the total equivalent resistance. And we also know that in if we treat that as just one big loop, so we've got like the battery, we've got effectively one big resistor, 9.8 ohms, and those are connected in just a single loop. So with a 9.98 volt battery and effectively a single 9.8 ohm resistor, you can write out the loop rule for that, epsilon minus IR equals zero. Solve for I, you'll just get epsilon over R. So that's 98 volts divided by 9.8 ohms. 98 over 9.8 would be 10. So that's a 10 amp current through the battery, but then as soon as it hits the junction, it splits up. Any questions on that so far? And in general, I find this mapping out the voltages approach to be very useful for analyzing circuits. As long as you know the, the battery's voltage and you know all the resistances and you're just trying to find the currents, this seems to be, in my opinion, the most, most direct and useful approach to do it. Uh, figure out, so simplify the resistors, figure out the current through the battery, and then start using delta V formulas to figure out how much voltage are you gaining or losing across each thing that changes it and then just map out or label all of the voltages of every region of the current in the circuit. And once you've got labels for the voltage at every location and the current through every path, you know everything you need to know about the circuit. It's effectively equivalent to the loop rule. It's just a different way of looking at how to label everything. Any other questions on that? And if you want some more general practice on circuit analysis, go to math.nchees.org slash p7b and look for, there should be a link to a, for, a worksheet of just circuit practice problems. Just a bunch of diagrams of circuits. It doesn't have any instructions, but the idea is much like this one. You know the battery's voltage, you know all the resistors, you're trying to find all the currents and label all the voltages. So give that a try if you need more practice and I will see you next time. You're welcome.